This lecture is going to focus on Shakespeare's Sonnet 73, also known as uh, that time of year thou mayest in me behold. And so I'm going to pull it up here on the screen and you can see that this includes a link to a paraphrase and an analysis of the sonnet. I'm going to walk you through my version of it. As with all sonnets, we'll begin by reading it and then I will um, discuss it some and give you an overview of what's happening in this Shakespearean sonnet. Sonnet 73. That time of year thou mayest in me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day, as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong, to love that well, which thou must leave ere long." So this, um, at first glance, has a lot packed into it, but you're going to see here the three symbols and metaphors that we discussed in our sonnet um, overview that are very common in literature. And these comparisons are used in music, movies, everyday speech. We make this comparison all the time. And so let's identify what these three metaphors are as an overview, and then we'll see how the sonnet illustrates them. So remember, we've already talked about how the seasons function as metaphors for our lives. Spring, summer, fall, and winter. Spring representing birth and renewal and everything that was dead is um, resurrected and comes back to life in the springtime. And summer represents that peak period in our life, the peak of temperatures, the peak time of year to enjoy life and experience the outdoors. It's related to um, our age and a time in our life, probably from somewhere in your mid-20s to your late 40s. These are the years when you've already learned enough to be completely independent, but you're making your own choices and you're having opportunities and you're experiencing new things. Life is very strong and vital um, during those years. And then the fall of our life is um, typically after the middle part of our life, um, past middle age, we cross over that threshold. Um, if you think of life as divided into two halves, this is the first part of the second half of your life. And that's represented by fall in literature when the leaves change colors and they start to um, fall off the branches and um, that represents aging. And then finally, winter represents that old age, that end stage of life. And ultimately, winter represents death when everything freezes over. Typically, if you see winter referenced in a poem, the poet is telling you something about death and you should dig a little bit deeper to see what you can find. That's going to be true of music. It's going to be true of paintings. It's going to be true of um, stories that you read. When you see the idea of winter, you're also talking about death. So um, the time of day is our second frequently um, used metaphor or symbol in literature. And the time of day also represents our life. Dawn represents the start of our life. Morning represents um, the youth, our growing and our learning things. Afternoon, again, represents the peak of life and evening or sunshine represents the aging after the halfway point. Twilight is when we are elderly at the end of life and night equals uh, the same as winter. Nighttime is a reference to death. The third symbol, uh, metaphor, that we'll see a lot in poetry, literature, and also in life is the idea of fire representing the stages of our life. And so fire starts with a spark, as does life. If you ever had a campfire, you know about a fire that is growing. The first flame catches on some small twigs. It begins burning the logs. Um, this is your childhood. As the fire grows, it represents your youth. And when it gets to that roaring part, that part where we all gather around and start to enjoy its fullness, 
that's the peak of your life. That would be similar to the afternoon if we were talking about time of day. It would be similar to summer if we were talking about seasons, but that's the roaring fire um, of your life, your peak. And during that part, we radiate warmth and strength. And from there, everything starts to die back or fade. The fire gets smaller, it gets less fierce, just like we do when we're aging, until eventually we're embers, and those are the final days of our life. Ultimately, the embers turn to ash, and ash is a very common symbol of death. So these three symbols all appear here in Sonnet 73, um, as they help us to kind of grapple with this poem that is about life and death. Let's look now at it line by line. I don't expect you to know all the ideas and languages that I'm about to point to, and it would be ridiculous to assume on a first reading that you might also see these things. So I'm going to analyze it with you here, and hopefully you can then appreciate the beauty and intention that's put into the craft of creating meaning in one of Shakespeare's sonnets. So not only does he choose these complex yet common ideas, but he also uses the very best words in the very best order, and he creates this perfect meter and this perfect rhyme scheme while doing it. And this is a very difficult thing to do. So let's just look briefly. You see the rhyme scheme. We've got the A rhyme of behold and cold, the B rhyme of hang and sang, C rhyme is day and away, next is west and rest. In the third quatrain, we see him rhyming fire and expire and lie and buy. And in the couplet, we see him using the GG rhyme of strong and long. Of course, as with all sonnets, we want to notice that it's 14 lines. And as I mentioned earlier, it's divided into those three quatrains, three groups of four lines. This would be the first one. Um, this would be the second one. This, of course, is the third quatrain, and the last two lines are called a couplet. And you'll remember that the quatrains present an issue, an idea, or a problem that needs to be solved, and then the couplet gives us the solution to that problem. Let's just go through this poem, quatrain by quatrain. In the first quatrain, he tells us, that time of year thou mayest in me behold where yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs. He's talking about the time of year when leaves are falling off the tree and changing colors. Um, they're yellow or they're none or they're only a few and they're hanging on these boughs that are shaking in the cold air. Um, he talks about bare ruined choirs. Choirs are another word for branches and so we're talking about these bare branches Choirs are also a place where people gather to sing, where voices gather in song, and he's talking about the choirs of the birds singing on the branches. And so he's first saying, you might notice in me that I'm in the fall of my life, that time of year you might behold in me. You might notice that I'm in the fall of my life. And then in the second quatrain, he says, in me, you see the twilight of such day. I'm at the end of the days of my life, right? Um, I'm at twilight. That means I don't have much darkness left. The sunset is fading in the West. Sunsets are another metaphor. The sun rises in the morning, it sets in the evening. Another metaphor for understanding our lives and um, the starting and the ending. And of course, the peak of the day is when the sun is shining directly above and that's our summertime. Um, and he says, but by and by, black night takes the sun away. So every sunset eventually fades into nighttime, as does my life. And then he says, death's second self. And death's second self is the uh, time we sleep. So when you go to sleep at night, that is... Um, often a symbol for dying in literature and in life. Um, what we know about nighttime is that when we sleep, um, it's, it's the resting of our bodies and our minds, and we're not aware of what's happening during that time. And death is often referred to as resting in peace. So sleeping is sort of practice for our eternal rest. Um, but anyhow, death's second self is when we die every single day into our sleep. So we give up the day living that we were doing and we go into that state of rest. So our daily lives are actually symbols 
for our extended lives. And, and that's in reality, that's not even only in poetry. So we move through the hours of a day, just like we move through the stages of a life. Um, in the third stanza, he talks about, you might notice in me the glowing of that fire. Um, he's talking about those embers, those coals that are still burning in the fire. And so if that's where we are in the fire, the fire has roared, it has died back, and now all we have are these glowing embers that sit on the ashes of his youth. We know that ash is always going to represent death. And so he's saying, I am, my youth is dead, that's over. And this is the deathbed where it will all expire. So these ashes, this heap, this fire um, is consumed with which it was nourished by. So the same thing that nourished it and lived its full life has now been consumed. Um, and then in these last two lines, we have our couplet and he says, so this is actually kind of dreary up to this point in our three quatrains, he presents this problem, the idea that you are looking at me at the end of my life, in the fall of my life, um, I am about to expire. So that's sort of depressing, right? But he finishes it with, a couplet that's going to resolve it for us. This you perceive, this you can see, but it makes your love more strong. How on earth does sitting here noticing that you're in the fall of your life and about to die make our love more strong? He answers in the final line, to love that well which thou must leave ere long. And he's saying that one of the greatest risks we take in life is to love someone when we know that we're not immortal, that we know that it's not going to be forever, but it's a very beautiful thing to know that we love anyway. So for you to be here with me, even at this stage in my life, when I'm about to expire and you still love me, that's a beautiful thing. And so that's a brief summary of how Sonnet 73 works. <laughs>